out pretty well. Uh, what I'm going to do today, well, I guess I'll tell you who I am. I'm a geologist. I've been doing this for decades. Um, everything from grassroots exploration, uh, company analysis, feasibility studies, bank audits. I worked for Rick Rule for four or five years as his analyst. Uh, started an Exploration Insights newsletter. Sold that four or five years ago to Joe Mazumdar, and he and I still work together on that. But I'm independent. Please, please letter. So we're going to talk about turning rocks into money uh, the hard way. Meaning, this is actually due diligence. It has to be done on these things. Uh, where are we going to go? A quick thing on the start of the state of the industry. Uh, what sort of money's in it? Uh, mining and exploration. Then get right down to uh, due diligence. I'll have some stories to tell on busts, good projects, bad projects, what to look for, that sort of thing. Real quick, this is a year old now, but, and, and you all know this, I think that's why you're here, is that senior miners are at a whole historical discount to gold in terms of valuations and gold price. That's, we know that. That's probably a good sign, a good thing for us right now. Um, and money. There's a lot of money in the sector. More than I really you'd think. But at $1,500 gold, the majors generate about $71 billion in free cash. At 1850 they generate about $113 billion in free cash flow, which is about where we are right now. Uh, copper miners are in the same, doing the same thing. Doing, they're doing fantastic. Um, November through November of last year, there were 129 IPOs around the world raising $1.8 billion, uh, another $20 billion in equity, which was up 19% from previous year. A lot of that's been going into more of the battery metals, lithium, some uranium, that sort of thing. And Canadian financings last year, $5 billion hard, $1.7 flow through. So there's cash out there. So what are they doing with all that cash? Uh, given the, say, call it a $10 billion overall budget, 38% mine site, 36% late stage, and 26% grassroots. Most of it goes to gold, 20% to copper, silver, nickel, and 15% other. And again, that's that battery metal portion that's gone up. Uh, and you can see on the, on the slide here, projected exploration budget increase going forward. All right, so how's that going? You're not so good. It's getting harder and harder to actually make a legitimate discovery. If you make a legitimate discovery, it's taking longer and longer to put these things into production, especially the tier one, larger one. Uh, for a copper deposit, you're looking on average 10 to 20 years, if you can get it pulled off, uh, depending on the jurisdiction. This goes through and shows um, gold deposits from 1990 up through 2019. These are discoveries uh, in light blue. The hard blue is projected, what they're expecting, what this group is just expecting. I do want to make a caveat here. Recently, there's been a couple of big discoveries that probably aren't here in terms of rupert resources, uh, some stuff down in Ecuador, a couple of discoveries in, in Australia. But we're still not finding near as much as we're producing as an industry. Uh, for instance, we're burning through one Carlin trend, about 90 million ounces a year production. We're certainly not finding 90 million ounces a year. Uh, ditto with copper. We're burning through one Bingham Canyon a year. If you've flown into Salt Lake, you've seen it. One of those a year. We're not finding and putting one of those in production a year. So there's, there, there is a real deficit, and this is going to be really important for us looking at junior mining companies. Well, what do they need to find? Uh, this is key. This shows the uh, grade for, uh, in grants per ton versus the log of the enterprise value of some of the uh, mines out there, the company. And the ones in red, those are the high grade deposits that are giving the companies the best valuation. So what they need to find are those deposits. High margin deposits, long life deposits. Very hard to find. 
The ones down there in the lower corner, not so much. But that's what you usually find. Okay. Let's talk about spreadsheet mind versus real life mind. Uh, what this shows in the lighter brown are mines in production. Uh, they're all in sustaining costs and grade for the proven and profitable. And it's quite remarkable that the, the ones below, the ones in that blue box, those are not in production. This is just numbers based on the pre-fees or feasibility study. And remarkably, they're almost all better than the ones in production. The ones in production have already been built, they've worked out the kinks, they've solved the metallurgical problems, they've stripped it, yet these are showing much lower costs. Are you surprised or should you be leery? And here's a little chart that shows what what your what these various technical studies give you in terms of margin of error for a preliminary economic study, which is basically a scoping study that people put together. Just we've got a sort of resource. This is sort of what we think it'll cost to mine it. This is sort of how we think we'll mine it. And this is sort of what we think you know, the end result will be. Uh, those are off 30 to 50 percent on average. I mean, that's the spread that they can be. And I'd say nine out of 10 at least are always over optimistic. When you drop down to the preliminary economic studies, um, I'm sorry, the pre-feasibility studies, you're looking at 20 to 30 percent margin of an error. Again, from my experience, and I suspect most of your experience, those are always higher than what comes in when the mine's built. And even down to the feasibility study level, you're off 20 to 11 percent on average. Again, that's usually high. As things happen on mines, you don't always see. And look, the primary reasons for busts. Number one is the resource estimate. A sloppy resource estimate, that is what everything is built on. So the engineers take that resource estimate as fact. Uh, and then they build around that. If that's wrong, everything down the line is wrong. That's the primary reason. Uh, and I think it's a lot of internal evolution, bad geology, bad modeling. Uh, that's where that usually comes into play. Metallurgy, lots of times it's more complex than expected. Uh, CapEx and OpEx, unrealistic estimates. Social and environmental issues that pop up, that happens a lot. And I think a lot of times when well, whether there's money or not, there's always desperation among bankers to raise money to get the fees. So that's a bit of a conflict of interest there. And here's a short list of disasters. And at the bottom, I said you could add your favorite here. Uh, I'm still going to keep that in the disaster category. <laughs> oh my God, that's that's gone nuts. The, uh, the Reddit crowd have got hold of it. And it's just taking it to 260 or something. Crazy. Someone's going to get hurt. And I don't think it's going to be anyone in this room. <laughs> All right. So let's look at one study that I think is really, really unrealistic. This is. Spanish, uh, Spanish Mountain closet in BC up the coast. Um, I've been there a few times. They did a pre-feasibility study uh, mid last year. Uh, based on 1,600 dollars gold, they got an NPV of 655 million, IRR 22 percent, capex only 461 million plus another 234 million in sustaining cap, which is basically the way they can get the IRR where it is. Uh, stable stage processing, it's kind of nuggety, sulfitic, erratically distributed ore. There are bits of uh, areas with carbon in it. And again, the, their study comes in the blue and the 
you add on top the, the yellow, lower than your average producing deposit. This thing averages 0.63 grams per ton recovered. And this is what it really looks like. Now, this has been around for 15 years at least. There's been close to 100 million sunk into this thing. Market cap, 75 million. And I, I put on there where Sprott put money in. Not to say that the guy's make, you know, doesn't know what he's doing, but he's not. A lot of people follow Sprott just because he's Sprott. But you've got to realize that, at least myself, and probably some of you here anyway, don't have a billion dollars to throw around at 70 companies. Um, so he's making a broad bet. And although most of his bets probably aren't going to work, Five or ten percent of them do. He'll make lots of money. So he's got a different angle on investing than most of us have. Plus, he's got the the vision that goes going to move. I'm not I'm not going to bet on it. I want personally, and what Joe does in the newsletter, we're after something that's real. It's going to make money. That hopefully gets purchased by a major mining company. All right, let's get down to some details. Um, when you're looking at a news release or a website, the drill pattern, that tells you a hell of a lot. This is from Gold Gold. The, the black, this is a, a surface map. Black lines are drill holes. You can see they're all basically going the same direction, hitting the same orange vein. So they, they clearly understand the geology. Clearly, have a sense of how close the drilling has to be to come up with a resource. So this is what you want to see: is that it tells you the company understands the geology, they're doing the data, they're putting it up on their website, and that's what it looks like. They've done quite well, and I, I think they'll continue to do well. Now they're understanding the district. There's lots of stuff they have to find. That's what a good drill pattern looks like. What is this drill pattern? The surface map, the darker lines are the more recent ones they re in this release. The other lines behind that are additional drill. That <laughs> tells me they haven't really got a clue what the structural controls are, what the uh, continuity is, etc. This is a disaster waiting to happen. Um, the poor gold continuity and also one thing that I always triggers my red flag if you will is in the news release they've got you know, 80 meters 3 grams 16 at almost 4 grams one at uh, 97 grams another one at 57 grams what is this? is it a large bulk mineral deposit or is it a narrow vein deposit those are two completely different types of deposits requiring very, very different mining methodology. So, so what is it? What, what this is, it's an intrusive that's been crackled up with some scattered veins running through it that when they intersect, the grade blows out. In reality, this is not a mine. And that's what it looks like. Um, that little star there is when they announced their, their resource, 1.9 million inferred at 0.65 grams. That doesn't work. So that drill pattern told you right off the bat, this has probably got some issues. And the, vari the variability in the width and grade. And there is smearing on that one. And there's smearing. smearing. You, you all know what smearing grade is, basically taken a high-grade uh, assay and smear it across a lot of low-grade mineralization. So it ups the whole thing. So here's a good example. Three gold. They announced they intersected 573 meters at 1.21 grams. Very nice hit. And that starts at surface. Within that were three meters at 131 grams. Joe and I built this neat little tool you can use called the drill hole interval calculator. 
you can link it from our website at Exploration Insights. But what you do is you put in the long interval of grade and then the narrow interval in grade. And at the bottom, you end up with the residual grade. So if you pull out that three meters of 131 grams, the rest of that 570 meters runs 0.52 grams. Not or. Whereas one point was a one point uh, two grams might be. You got to be very careful of that. Very careful of that sort of thing. And use that all the time. That free. Go to the website. Pull that calculator down. Save it. Use it all the time. And that's what it looks like. And again, I put Sprout in there when he invested that. Again, the point is, don't just blindly follow the guru. Do your own diligence. Figure out what's going on. Okay, and let's talk about spectacular hole. This, this is an old example um, in uh, Colombia. Build 270 meters at 1.23, 217 at 1.54. Those are nice hits, right? But look at the geology of this thing. Basically, they've got a small plug of intrusive coming up into this rock, into a valley of sorts. And so all your mineralization is contained in this, essentially this, the gray intrusive rock. What's it going to take to get that out? And the grade's not good enough for an underground. You've got to remove all that blue material. That's, that's waste. Strip ratio. So this, again, this is not going to work. Fight the good drill holes. When you look at the cross section, you say, whoa, they've got so much waste to move to get to this little bit of ore. Uh, you've got to consider, what's, how much is strip going to be? What's it going to cost to advance this? And eventually they came out with an in measure, indicating inferred 1.4 million ounces, 1.1 gram. And this is what it looks like. <laughs> Um, you're getting a pattern here, aren't you? Um, and eventually, this the uh, Gold Mining Inc. bought this and was uh, touting it as, a, as one, of the, one of their many resources. But uh, the study that was done shows an NPP 231 million and a seven year payback. Not what you want, huh? Okay. Unrealistic drill targets. I love this one. Um, this company, RT Minerals, projected a vein that um, Lakeshore was mining from surface down three kilometers that then went on to their property. So they raised four million bucks to drill this hole for 3.4 kilometers down to see if they could find the depth extension of Lakeshore's deposit. And the target is this, the width of a side rock, a couple meters. Let's pretend they are successful. What's it going to cost to delineate a high-grade vein at that depth? To get a resource out of a high-grade vein, you're looking at minimum 50 meters spacing. So they're going to have to drill how many three-kilometer long holes? Production cost, what's that going to I mean... What the fuck, right? So, per scale, this is what it looks like. Uh, that's the drill target. And I threw up this, uh, a local example. If from the Venetian all the way down to the Luxor Hotel, if you walk that, that's 3.4 kilometers. Think about it. That's what they're drilling to hit something the size of it. And they're advised by the operator that no significant gold organization was encountered in the deep hole. All right, let's talk about vein. Get right down to it. This is a vein in um, Northern Ireland that, that I have been to a few times. And the blue points to some quartz veins within the structure. That's where the gold is held. The green is what 
the mining width of this thing. And what we're after in high grade veins is uh, continuity. And what we're going to look at is how to envision this actually gets mined so that you get a better sense of when you're looking at high grade drill results and such. All right, there's only two rock types in the mining. Ore makes money, waste loses. The key here is to keep waste to a minimum or to a maximum. So your vein that I showed in that previous one is about one and a half meters wide. Your mining width is going to be three, mite, three meters wide. So if your vein of one and a half meters averages 10 grams, and you've got another one and a half meters of zero dilution, that grade drops from 10 grams to 5 grams. So that's your mining grade. And that drops the, you know, the value of the ore just as much. Make sense? Okay. Um, to drill these things off, you need pretty close space drilling because there's a lot of internal geologic things that can happen. Many times, a vein is along a structure that's long lived. It'll put up the quartz vein mineralization, but lots of times a, a volcanic, barren volcanic dike will run right through or something. What I've shown here is internal waste. So even within the vein, there's post mineral material that came in, and that's going to get mined, and that's going to drop your, your mined grade as well. So you've got to watch for that. And that's something that is really caught a lot of underground miners. I think most recently, pure gold has got that. Uh, Rubicon was a great example of how not to uh, do a resource list. Prior to raising 500 million bucks, we came out with a news release. Uh, Infield Drip Room program confirms continuity and grade of the F2 deposit and continues to encounter high grade mineralization. You can see the chart. Uh, something obviously went wrong there. And this is sort of what went wrong. The initial resource in 2013 um, at a grade of, on average, call it nine grams a ton, with about all in three and a half million ounces. Once they started figuring out the structural control to this, what was happening, the eventual indicated grade came down 21%, and the ounces dropped by 97%. And those three little figures kind of give you a sense of what was being modeled. The initial one, the red, it was a very simple thing. And then in 2016, they came in and did a bit more work. And they're just finding that actually there's a lot of internal waste, the green, between the veins. It was a bit messed up. And in 2018, when they had a lot more detail, it got much, much more complicated. Again, look at all that internal waste. The red's what you want. Green and the blue is not what you want. That was the problem. They had not done enough detailed work on it. Understand it. Uh, here's another one, Eleanor. Gold Court Pop, uh, Virginia. Great deal. The black lines are the drill holes. The, the blue line was the initial interpret interpreted what the vein looked like. And that's what they based the resource on. So you can see that kind of, it's just a bulbous uh, model that, that, you know, it matches the drill hole pretty much. But when they got down to the detail, the ore was actually in a vein that had been folded like this. So all that internal waste affected not just the grade, but the mining method. So less ounces, more waste, higher cost, less production. This is another Simpler example, if we just had a straight vein model, and in reality it was curved like this, in this example, excuse me, uh, we had 60% more tons to be mined, which got us 10% more ounces, but 25% less grade. And that's just based on the vein doing this rather than this. Again, it, you, you've got to drill off these high-grade veins very close. All right, this is a sort of a composite of the deposit types that you can get in a uh, volcanic environment, like on the Andes. 
Each one of these red bits represent a different deposit type that's possible. Not, not that they're there, but this is the sort of thing you might find. In reality, less than 1% of these are going to become economic. Okay, that's nice. At least you can see. Okay, we can figure this out. Well, the reality is... Uh -oh. There we go. Um, that's what we're looking at. We're on the back side of the Andes of Project. We're looking at. So it's not that easy to know what you're looking at. Point being that. Uh, another picture of the Andes, Chilean Andes. Each one of those stars represents a volcanic center and some sort of geochemical, or at least alteration, anomaly. Until you go there and look at each one of those, you don't know what might there or might, might not be. So there are anomalies all over the place. Very few of those are going to turn into mine. The key, I think, is to know when to quit. Of course, the company needs to know when to quit looking something and move on, and so does the investment. Um, one more thing. Uh, this is in Peru, a project I went to, and the surface sampling they'd done, rock sampling, was all on top of the hill, and it, it was a very consistent soil, golden soil anomaly. But what struck me was they hadn't really gone down below and taken any samples. Uh, big red flag. I've seen this in a number of places where the dip slope of a hill, their sampling, is also mineralization, and there's absolutely nothing below it. You want to be careful of that. Uh, one more, location, location, location. This uh, company put out some great results, 40 meters at 5 games, grams 28 at 1.3. That's where it is on that red hill on that ridge. What do you do with that? Where do you put the mine? How do you, that, that river floods every, every wet season. Where is it tailing? So you've got to look at that as well. Where is it actually located? I've seen uh, great sounding drill holes in Columbia that go right, you know, right under a church. Can't, it ain't going to work. But unless you know those things, you can get pretty well hosed. So why bother with science due diligence? That's why. Very important. Uh, summarizing, you want to, as a, you're, knowing that most of the deposits, most of these aren't going to work, your job as an investor or a speculator in this is to efficiently kill it as quickly as possible. Find the fatal flaw and move on. Know the funding requirement. How much is it going to cost this company to bring it forward? Do you know when the when to stop or to keep going. What do you need to see to continue going? What are the economic parameters of the deposit you're looking for? If the company doesn't know what it's going to cost to build it, how the hell are they going to know if they find it? Uh, likewise, geologic parameters. Does this fit? Is this a porphyry copper? If it is, does it fit the model? Uh, social problems, the success meaning. So many companies I visit with, even if they're successful, it does not, it's not meaningful to the share. You know, you, they can increase their market cap, but if the share price doesn't increase, it does us no good at all. So important. Uh, finally, if you don't want to do all that work, explorationinsights.com does it for you. Um, the Joe, the, Joe Mazumdo, he owns the letter, he writes it. He's an excellent geologist. The letter's about what he and I are, or basically he is buying with his money, why, um, everything we've done, Sold, written about, is available, and there's lots of good information on the website right now. In fact, there's a report he wrote on Los Gatos fill deposit. You can pull down, see what went wrong there. Exploration is there. Stop. Come go there. Thirty four seconds. There's an, we're, we're ahead of time with the timer anyway, but this is literally two minutes. We could take a question. Yeah, here's okay. one down here. I can hear you. <laughs> I'm just going to speak up. So, at the beginning of your presentation, you identified the problem of a declining resource base. My question to you is Are technologies like board sorting a game changer for deposits that were previously 
uneconomic because of complex theology. They become economic because you can deal with the waste problem you mentioned with a technology like or sorting, for example. Um, yeah, there is, there, you know, we're always developing new technologies that help. And or sorting is certainly one that itself. I know Novo is using that with their stuff in, in Australia and it's working. So on specific deposits, or sorting will work. Uh, there's a lot of new technologies as well in terms of assaying. Uh, we've got the Chrysos out of Australia has got the, the new method of assaying that's much quicker and, and good. So that there are things that are making, making the, the industry in certain aspects of it cheap. Also at the same time, it's getting harder and harder to find things because everything we're looking for now is going to be blind, undercover, more complex. Thank you very much. Let's have a round of applause.